and welcome to the 1913 Lockout Podcast Series. I'm your host, Moira Murphy. A hundred years ago, the majority of Dublin's working people were housed in tenements. In his report into housing conditions, 1914, John Cook wrote, I condemn the whole of the tenement system now existing. It breeds misery and worse. It causes a great waste of human life and human force. Men, women and children can never rise to the best that's in them under such conditions. This week's show will look at the changes over the years to housing in the city and the struggles which have taken place to improve conditions as well as addressing the lack of centrality housing plays in the current political discourse. We'll be speaking to oral historian Terry Fagan of the North Inner City Folklore Project and the geographers Owen O'Mahony and Stephen Rigney on their current dereliction project, as well as looking at what James Conley had to say on the matter. Um, I'm joined now by Terry Fagan of the North Inner City Folklore Project. Uh, Terry, cheers. Thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the North Inner City Folklore Project. Well, the North Inner City Folklore Project was set up around 19, then about the late 1970s, 80s. And it was set up to record the local history in the North Inner City. And when it was first uh, up and running, it was done to what was called a part of a, a community employment scheme. And I think at one stage there was about 25 people on it. But over the years, the people had kind of moved on to other jobs and left and the whole of them. So by, by around the, the late 1980s and heading into the 90s, uh, there was only two of us left on it, myself and another guy called Ben Savage. So we ended up staying there and uh, our job was really to go around and collect the oral history of the North in the city. So we're, we're about 30, 30 years or more uh, collecting we were. So Benny uh, himself, the other folklorist that was with me, he kind of left. At, then There's only myself left on it. And we, we, we collected a huge archive of audio recordings and video, uh, sorry, uh, audio recordings and a huge archive of photographs which were given to us by the people uh, who we, some of them who we interviewed that gave us copies of the photographs and there were photographs of the houses that he lived in, the tenement houses, photographs inside the tenement houses. And that would go along with the stories that they were telling us about their lives growing up and living in, in the Dublin tenements and uh, pretty harrowing stories, a lot of them, like, you know. How much popular myths is there about sort of tenement in 1913? And then if you take the continuation of tenements after independence. Yeah. Well, you see, the tenements were the same as they were in 1914, as they, they were in the 1930s, 1940s, right? Very little has changed. People were still living with no running water, no toilets, no thing. Nothing had changed. Okay, the economic end of it might have changed in the way of employment, you know? which kind of might have lessened the hardship. But I mean, you must realise when people were making money, the rents went up. Went up. So people were paying high rents for, 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 for dog boxes because when the 1800s, when the Act of Union happened, when tenement life came about and these landlords took over these houses and the whole lot, so the story is when the rich marched out, the poor marched in. But when speculators bought into these houses and converted them into small little dog boxes and packed as many as the poor they could into them, they could charge whatever rents they wanted. You know, we didn't like it. We didn't like it, so what? Just go. Somebody else. Where do you think the uh, the modern day slumlord would fit into this? Like, you know, has it been a culture of tenements where it's seen as acceptable to provide people with, like, substandard accommodation? Well, I can tell you something. And I, te- and I can say this with, with sincerity. Dublin City Council today have provided some of the best accommodation that I've seen. You know, and, and I'm talking about this area. You're right. Because gone are the days when it was Dublin Corporation and when, uh, when, when there was no consultation with the people. But today, Dublin City Council consults the people and they're brought in on the planning, they're brought in on the design and the layout. And some of the flats that they built today in this area, without a shadow of a doubt, a state-of-the-art accommodation. And I mean it. Now, I'm not saying there's no substandard housing. There probably is around, but what I've seen is uh, is nothing but the best. Like I mean, okay, you have the houses that were built in the in the, in the forties, under the thirties and forties. A lot of those flats today and have been for the last years being renovated up to standard. You know what I mean? But I mean, people people have it in the sense that the, the accommodation they're in is good in many ways. But there's also people out there. In, in, in very bad housing conditions and overcrowding housing conditions like you know what I mean and that's 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 been a big feature 
But where the real slum end of it comes into is the landlords. They have borrowed, when the, in the Celtic toy, they borrowed into, into houses, into these uh, former uh, Georgian houses in, around the city. And like everything else before them, they've also converted them into small rooms and packed as many as the people that's willing to pay the high rents into them. You know, that was, that was okay. People just wanted them and was, they could pay the rents, the whole lot. Now that the economy has gone, bust, the economic boom has gone, uh, and now people are stuck in these places and the landlords are still looking for high rents you know and these people can't afford them and they're overcrowded some of them are fire hazards you know some of them are debt traps so you know many ways things like that haven't changed but when it comes to the city city council end of it as far as I can see now we can only talk about this area the house, housing condition the housing standards in, in the area is good I'm not saying there's, there's there's families there that that that, that would have a lot would have uh, there's families there there's mothers and fathers there that would have their children plus their children with them you know what I mean because there's a big housing waiting list and you know what I mean but I there's a lot of housing coming on stream that's been had been taken back by Namit these are the stuff that needs to be put put back into the housing stock that given to city council. That they 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 can house people on the on the list, and many ways that's starting to come about, because there's no one going to be buying those houses now, because I mean they're talking another, well, five ten years before the economy ever picks up again, so those place those those places should be handed over without a shadow of a doubt to the council, and the council or to the other housing agencies, and then given out to the people, assessed what people's needs are to give them to, because. At the end of the day, it's the people who's paying for this in many ways. Like I mean, like I mean, we're paying the banks. What's that happening? The, the, the people, that, people, that, people, that, people are screwed to the wall. Workers are screwed to the wall. They're paying back for the, 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 the sins of the fathers, more or less. When I say the fathers, the banks, the developers. So you're paying, they're paying for all this. And the, 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 the being, in many ways, people have been crucified through all the, through all the, the charges and all the whole lot. I don't have people are going to survive. I'm joined by Owen O'Mahony and Stephen Rigney, two geographers based in Minas. They're currently undertaking a project looking at their election in North Inner City of Dublin. It started off with an idea from Owen, mentioned in the pub before than anywhere else, and um, he, we were talking about derelict spots in the city and how many there are there, and he just mentioned the idea of why don't we go mapping them and I've been looking for for a while trying to think of a way to tell stories about the city to, to switch perspectives on the city um, to look at different ways of of mapping Dublin that could tell that could look at different social processes going through the city and that, that idea of mapping dereliction and mapping disuse just clicked with me because I thought it allowed us to get beyond that view of when you your conventional maps of of a city of anywhere, they've got the streets, you know, and everything outside the streets is terra incognito. So you're looking from the streets and you're not expecting to see all this private property um, on, all, on all the sides because that's not part of the public realm. Yeah, I think one of the, 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 the main objects behind the project initially was to come to, for me at least, a better understanding of why so many sites in this particular part of Dublin are left vacant and especially as we've now come out of one of the most sustained booms of property based uh, speculation um, I was kind of wondering to myself why so many places remain derelict throughout that time um, and I, I, it kind of expanded then as Steve has already said about uh, looking at derelict sites which aren't mapped on traditional ways of thinking about the maps of the city so we, we wanted to kind of include those in in a, in a, in a different map of Dublin I suppose so how do you feel the election reflects how Dublin works as a city, especially you mentioned in terms of class? I think uh, you can see the um, the kind of the relationship between classes in, in, in what gets left derelict. There is a sense in which, on the one hand, um, speculation uh, is allowed to take place unhindered uh, because of specific uh, relationships between classes and, uh, and the dominant idea of one class. But on another level, there's the idea that housing doesn't matter so much. Uh, housing continues to be kind of secondary, if even secondary, 
to the major struggles of the day in the city. Um, and also that sense in which the city is not always somewhere that we live. It's seen as a, a kind of a platform for business or a platform for development. And development usually meant, you know, for-profit speculation. And, and that goes back to who gets to decide how the land is used and for whom. So you have these sites in a city, you know, in a part of the city, which is tight on green space, you know, which um, is short on, on housing. You know, you have all these, you have all these housing using units remaining empty. You have all these vacant sites remaining closed off because they're waiting for, you know, the profits to pick up again on them. So you have this, you have this uh, boundary of public and private is mirrored by this boundary between land that's just abstracted as commodity and need for land, need for use of land. The Land's Private Property, Landlordism and Housing feature heavily in Connolly's writings, from his first foray into political activity and trade unionism on the streets of Edinburgh, followed by his time as an organiser for the Irish Socialist Republican Party at the turn of the century, to his writings on Dublin following his return from America. Housing and the land, for Connolly, represented the essence of the Irish question, the whole age-long fight of the Irish people against their oppressors, for the mastery of the means of life, the source of production in Ireland, who would own and control the land, the people or the invaders. Connolly accused past movements of ignoring this fundamental issue, or even drawing political support from the very landlords who presided over the worst slums in Europe. In the depths of the lockout, December 1913, Connolly reported on the eviction of 60 families in East Wall by the Merchants Warehousing Company. But the Irish worker, he writes, This outrage was intended to frighten its victims and to make them cry out for mercy, but it did neither. The women and children jeered at the bailiffs and policemen. The women and children got mouth organs and danced reels and jigs on the streets. The women and children hurrahed and cheered for Larkin and the Transport Union. Connolly sets out in this story to illustrate that Dublin existed in its people and not its property and that the memory of the city was the memory of wrongs such as evictions, famines, and social subjection. Connolly made clear his view that there was much to do, equally in the towns and in the country. As his criticisms of the United Irish League in their dealings with the land question show, were the landlords to disappear tomorrow and their titles to land to become extinct, the peasant proprietors remaining would still be involved in a hopeless struggle for subsistence. Not satisfied with appeals to Irish patriotism to hand landlords political power on top of their economic power, Connolly called on United Irish League founder William O'Brien to tell us a single sufficient reason for refusing to apply to property in towns the same stern principles he would advocate in the country. While advocating the end of landlordism in the long term back in Dublin, Connolly also laid out concrete solutions to alleviate the sufferings of tenant dwellers. He proposed what could be described as a public works project, that is, the erection of houses to be let at cost of construction and maintenance, as well as the repair of houses whose owners could not keep them in habitable state. Such actions, taken with the taxation of unlet houses, were meant to lower rents overall. However, these measures were only meant to address the immediate problems of the tenements. Connolly imparted a vision of the city as a place for its citizens to flourish, rather than to simply work and exist. Our cities, he says, can never be made really habitable or worthy of an enlightened people while the habitations of its citizens remain property of private individuals. Housing, seen as a public good, was to Connolly a key measure in bringing about the enlightenment. To permanently remedy the evils of the city, he concludes, the citizens must own their own city. the absence of the sort of housing question or the right to the city as it were and in terms of discourse and political in the political arena or in trade unions how do you feel that could be rectified or some sort of movement around that could come around well you know you're talking about your the documentaries about the connection between 1913 and today in 1913 Larkin could be criticised for not taking sufficient account of the needs to have housing in the city, or at least not using it pragmatically, if you think about the Church the church Street collapse, um, 1913. And similarly, I think today, 
the the trade union negotiations, like in the likes of for the likes of Croke Park Two, and um, Croke Park One, are so concentrated on um, wages and return for productivity. Um, but you're seeing though why then you've got to ask why the Croke Park Two was rejected and why where the opposition came from. And when you think about interviews with nurses and guards, um, public sector workers, you know they referred back again and again to things like the cost of living, the cost of housing. You know, so it's it, you can't just concentrate. You know, it, 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 I think the, the the point has come where we can't purely concentrate on wages and the you know the right the the, the, the how much how much productivity we can we already provide in certain in return for wages. We have to start talking now about how much we need to live, how much we need for our housing, and that comes to a, a, another extended problem of how much are we paying. On our mortgages, how much are we paying in rent? You know, who is getting this money, and you know, are we, is this is this turning into this double this double taxation, this double debt burden on us of both mortgage, you know, for the private and, and, and for as a private debt, and then this massive public debt coming out to bail bail out the banks. And I think there's some kind of key contradictions that are becoming more uh, obvious now. Uh, as Stephen said already, you know, people are referring to their cost of their housing and the cost of, of um, renting and, and, uh, and buying out your own house. Um, and the contradictions around that are becoming more apparent even in the, the strike we've seen this week of the, the bus uh, or the, the bus workers. Um, they would refer explicitly to being caught again and again for the cost of their housing and paying local property taxes and so on. So the relation the relations are quite obvious for some groups in Irish society, but again and again it gets pushed down the, the agenda because it, um, it, those kind of contradictions expose a, a class relationship that we don't really want to talk about or can't acknowledge. Over the years, there was a lot of, a lot of campaigns for, for better housing and for, you know, for communities to remain together. In the North Inner City, there was a, during what was called the Gregory, the Gregory deal, the Gregory era, where communities came, in, came together and stood together and fought together against the the, re, the, re, the redevelopment of the communities, which the, the 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 plan was to scatter communities out to the far parts of Dublin or further afield, so people kind of got together and, and then mainly it came about with the, the election of Tony Gregory, who went on to ha, to hold the balance of power under Char, well Charlie Charlie Hottie would have been at the time seeking to be te- the, the the former government and Gregory was a man that held it, and his price was housing for the people in the community, and he succeeded. Beautiful houses were built around the thing. The whole houses built beyond people's dreams were built for them, you know. Unfortunately, the the government didn't last, and a lot of a lot of the Gregory had succeeded in getting the uh, the houses built. But like everything else, the government didn't last, and once the government fell, the deal went with it, you know. But Gregory did in the in the, in the thing, held them accountable for what was signed on to, and hence there'd be a beautiful houses built. Along Sean McDermott Street, Summer Hill, Garner Street, and those areas in the whole lot. So, you know, they have such a thing as people power that can change things, like, you know. But today, with City Council, and I mean, being there, what they do, I mean, I've been at meetings with them, and the plans are put out, and up in front of them said, this is what's happening, you know, this is, this is the strategy. So people, local people of local tennis associations are brought in, in many ways, on the actual design and layout of the house and all that. So you wouldn't have seen that years ago. That was all something they've never heard of. So things have changed in many ways, like, you know, for the better. But, like, it's already right having these lovely houses and things to hold up, but you need jobs. You need something to sustain people's lives in those houses. And at the moment now, there's nothing out there. I think it might be worth mentioning, to, just to make it contemporary again, is, is mm. the... Um, is the material that the, the, the council has revealed in its recent surveys of the housing in, in, in bed sits. the bed sits and so on. Mm. I think um, it's worth going back to, again, not just the conditions that these houses are in, but also in terms of ownership. Mm. You know, why are these the same places that they were 40 to 50 years ago when there were numbers, uh, large numbers of men and women moving to Dublin to fill uh, public service posts and teaching posts and and yet here we are fifty years later, and they're the, effectively the same housing units, um. In and and so again, that's another one of those kind of contradictions that gets exposed from time to time, um. And I suppose we're we're kind of um, 
were blessed then by the council providing misinformation themselves. But it remains to be seen whether that information can be kind of looked at more publicly. And I think that's an important uh, point of interaction for people to, to get involved. Um, I, the question there for why nothing is done about these, you can't overlook then the question of who owns these houses and where they come from, what class they come from, what relationships they have with others who can influence whether or not houses are going to be inspected, whether or not planning law is going to be inspected. You know, there's a great quote here from the, um, after the, the Church Street, um, in uh, September 2nd, 1913, and two houses collapsed on Church Street, causing seven deaths, and then there was a choir, an inquiry into the into the disaster um, a few months later. And um, a representative, William O'Brien, who was vice president of Dublin Trades Council, told the inquiry, I put it to you, sir, that if a landlord owns a house, and that house falls upon and kills some of the inmates, and that no inquiry is held, I put it to you that it is a reasonable assumption that it is because the owner is a member of the corporation that no such inquiry was held. So, you know, and in 1913, there was a very clear, very obvious connection between slum conditions and corporation aldermen. I mean, I think um, I might be wrong. I think what, at least one of the houses was owned by an alderman of the corporation. And the inquiry certainly identified, you know, a number of important figures around the city who were slum landlords. And so now, of course, I'm not saying, you know, that members of Dublin Corporation, Dublin County Council, or City Council are slum landlords. But if you look at something like the the um, the, the register of members' interests in Leinster House in, um, for the Rockets, you know, you'd see the number of members who have property interests. And again, I'm not saying that they're you know not dealing properly with their tenants or they're not bad, you know, they're not inhumane landlords. But still, it's like their interest is in you know in, in owning property and managing property for a profit. You know, or if they don't have their connections, their you know the the circles they move in is in mm-hmm. you know landlords, small scale landlords as you had in nineteen thirteen, as you had for much of Dublin's history. You know these small scale landlords of one or two or three houses, and so this is this is a, probably one of the most effective lobby groups in Ireland. You know, especially in Dublin. You know that these landlords who knew were related to were politicians, were you know created pressure or avert or covert against changing a regime which allowed their, them to get you know a living off substandard benefits yeah, and I think as well like the city is riven by inequalities and the country is riven by inequalities and I guess it's a question then of how those inequalities get man- made manifest and how they're in effect kind of spatialised you know they're they're made the, the inequalities become spatialised through the material landscape we see around us and as Stephen has said about where the interests lie and so we'll see a kind of a persistence of inequality in housing in particular because it remains in people's interest for that inequality to to be continued. There is no doubt that housing conditions today are on the whole significantly better than they were a hundred years ago. As we have seen, material gains have been made. Improved housing conditions and tenant rights can and have historically been won through the establishment of housing campaigns. However, What does remain unchanged is the overwhelming power that the landowning class wield over us. In the coming years, the city will be made effectively uninhabitable for many working class people. The unaffordable cost of housing will prevent the young from establishing their own lives here, being forced to emigrate or to move back in with their parents. And those are the fortunate ones that have homes to fall back on. Many families with mortgages will be plunged deeper into debt. We will no doubt see a rise in foreclosures, evictions and homelessness. The incoming property tax will encourage landlords to make their tenants pay for it through rent increases. And all of this is already happening today. The interests of the landowning class is fundamentally at odds with our need to live fulfilled lives. They see our homes as tools for speculation and their primary interest is in the accumulation of dead money. As Connolly saw it, housing must be made a public good something available to everyone, and not a privilege that most can barely afford. We must start asking the bigger questions. What is the cost of living? That is, the cost of reproducing our own lives day to day. The principal side of this activity is the home, and by extension, the neighbourhood and wider community. It is these needs which must be met above all else in order to live a fulfilled life in our city and our society. That's all for this week. 
If you would like to contribute or get in touch, email us at ub1913 at gmail.com or visit our website ub1913.wordpress.com. Contributors for this week's show were Podrick Madden, Miles Link, Barra Hamilton and Shane Fitzgerald. Thanks to Terry Fagan, Stephen Rigney and Owen O'Mahony. Produced by Tom McDermott and Moira Murphy.